Morning, everyone. <sighs> Nothing like something like that to unsettle me when I'm already a bit nervous. This being this huge crowd, but never mind. Um, so, yes, it's the second Sunday in our Advent series, which is called A Great Christmas. And we're talking about the great announcement. And uh, through this series, we're going to be looking at various passages in the Gospels, the familiar nativity Christmas stories. But we're also looking at the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. Uh, and it's always really good to put two passages of the Bible together and see how they talk to each other and inform each other. We get more out of that than, than just looking at one on its own. So I'm going to start by reading a very familiar passage in Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He'll be great and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word of God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. I don't know if you have a picture in your mind of... I'm going the wrong way. Yes. I don't know if you have a picture in your mind of what that event might have looked like. This is Nicolas Poussin, a French artist. Uh, and as I was reflecting on this, this picture came to my consciousness, uh, not because I researched it, but because Claudette has arranged a tour of the National Gallery on Friday evening. And as you're thinking of what you might invite friends to, or if you just like paintings in the National Gallery, next Friday evening, uh, you could sign up for a special tour of, of nativity pictures. I find this slightly odd. Uh, I find the arms like that. I'm not sure I would have envisaged the, the, the angel. Is he pointing at, at something? Um, and also the angel looks to me quite female. I don't know. And yet he's, he is called Gabriel. Um, so I'm thinking about this. And then, it, and then I saw this one from, from 200 years earlier. Um, this is a painting in... Florence, uh, and again an angel, lovely multicolored wings, uh, talking to someone with stomachache, it looks to me. Um, and the reason I was looking at this is um, because my foster daughter has a school trip coming up in February, and she and her friends are going to Florence. My school trips were to St. Albans and places like that. She, she's going to Florence as part of her art and photography a level, and they sent us um, Florence. They sent us some literature to help prepare for the journey. We, we learned about how this Duomo, this big cathedral, was built, and we learned that the builders took 140 years to finish it. So, if you've ever had a problem with a builder, just remember 140 years. Uh, and, and this bell tower, uh, Giotto's bell tower. Um, they didn't install a lift. Who knows? 413 steps they're going to have to, to climb to see the top of it. And we, we read about the Medici family as well and how they used to rule Florence in those days. So all this pre-reading for the trip is not essential. She could still go to Florence 
and have a wonderful time if she hadn't read it. But the fact that she has had the opportunity to read about the history beforehand will make her trip that much more. She will get much more out of it. Her understanding of what she sees will be that much greater. So we are on a journey, aren't we? We're on a journey through Advent at the moment. And we can just come on, turn up on a Sunday morning and listen to what the preacher says. Or we can do some pre-reading. And I'd encourage you to do some pre-reading. Maybe we're going to go through Hebrews. You could look at Hebrews and read it in between. And you'll get much more out of this journey. Um, we've got this wonderful resource called... What's it, what's it called? The Right, right Now Media. Um, and and it's, got, it's got a series, a video series on, on Hebrews. It's in the, the Gold Hill Library section. It'll, it'll enhance your understanding. I was thinking back to when I first became a Christian uh, and my early years of being a Christian. My understanding of Jesus was completely isolated from the background in which he grew up. He grew up under the Roman Empire with a strong influence of Greek Greece and the Jewish culture. And that's where our faith grows up. That's the environment in which the New Testament was written. And we are ambassadors for our faith. We're called ambassadors for Christ. And it's strange because I was an ambassador for Christ and I knew nothing about the country that I was representing. And so as I have grown in my faith, I have spent time trying to understand the context of the New Testament. And I would just encourage everyone to do that because it will enable your faith, your understanding, your witness of who Jesus is to be richer and more powerful. We've got brains. God's given us brains. And many of us have, have demanding jobs that require us to study and to learn. And we need to apply the same rigor to, that we do to our careers or our education as to our Christian faith. And then that will make us more effective. So Hebrews chapter 1, which is my parallel passage for this morning with this, is a really hard passage to understand for a 21st century Englishman because it's all about angels. And I don't remember a lot of teaching about angels in the church. But when you read the New Testament or read the Old Testament, it's full of angels, angels, angels. And Hebrews 1, it's angels on steroids, if you like. It's just angels all the way. So if we're going to understand what Hebrews chapter 1 is saying, we need to spend a little time doing our pre-reading about angels. Another thing from Florence. Uh, and with angels, I, I must admit, I am slightly sceptical. I have a sceptical mind. Um, people will come up with these marvellous stories of experiences they've had, and I'm thinking, yeah, really? Was it a delusion? Whatever. And the Christian church, sorry to say it, is probably a, more gullible than the population at large about spiritual things. I don't know. I throw that out as a suggestion. Joseph Smith claimed he met an angel, Moroni, who gave him a new revelation about what God was doing and lots of believing people followed him and became Mormons. But it was a deceit. So we need to be sceptical, but not too sceptical that we get rid of angels from our understanding because that would be non-biblical. The Bible is full of angels. But it's not very clear. It's like peering into angels is like looking through a kind of misty glass. You can't quite see what's going on. You know there's something there, but the story is a little confused. So I'll share some of what I've learned. Um, if you try Googling angels, it's not a great start. A load of rubbish spoken about angels. So I've tried to stick to what the Bible says or, or to what reputable theologians have gathered where they've studied scriptures and literature from the time of the Bible, from the Jewish culture. Before God created the heaven and the earth, he created angels. They were there, they watched him create the physical universe. Um, and that means they're not physical themselves, they are spiritual beings. 
Now, there are different types of angels. There are two particular, called seraphim and cherubim, or seraphs and cherubs, that seem to get marked out as slightly different. They seem to spend their time, a lot of them time, round the throne. When, when people like Ezekiel or Isaiah have visions of the throne, God on his throne, they see seraphim or winged creatures. They seem to be a, a, a special type of angels. Cherubim had a special job. Uh, when you hear the word cherub, What's the picture? Cute little chubby child? Uh, not like that in the Bible. They're, they're quite scary. Uh, and in fact, God put two cherubs outside the Garden of Eden when he chucked Adam and Eve out. There were two cherubs there guarding the way that you wouldn't get past them. Um, so they're not chubby little children. Um, but most angels, yeah, they're not physical but they can appear as physical entities. They can appear as human beings. They can talk to people. For some reason, I can't get my head around. They can only be in one place at a time, uh, mostly invisible. But we read in, in Daniel about how one of the angels was traveling and got held up for a long time. Um, so in the Old Testament, the Old Testament understanding, the, the understanding Mary would have had when the angel came to her was... There's God, there's angels, and there's human beings. And that kind of hierarchy. Angels have been around a long time. They were there since the beginning of the world. And they have spent their time watching what God does. And they love it. Because of where, how they can see God, they spend their time worshipping him. That's the reaction. And when we're singing here... Earlier, I don't know if you noticed, the angels were actually joining in the singing. You may or may not have heard them, but they love it when Christians get together and worship and they say, yes. They also love it when, Christian, when people first become Christians, when they first start following Jesus. There's a party in heaven, balloons, cake, it's singing, singing, lots of singing. They're, they're highly intelligent creatures. But they're also curious. They're intrigued by the way God deals with humans. It, it says in Peter, they, there's things that they, angels long to look into. And they have free will. They have moral responsibility. And some angels, particularly one called Satan or maybe Lucifer or whatever he wants to call himself, he rebelled. He wanted to make himself equal to God. And God wasn't having any of it, so he was thrown out. Um, and when angels rebel, when they sin, that's it. There is no path back into God's presence. They have no excuse. God doesn't offer a path of salvation for angels who rebel. But he does for us. Isn't that amazing? When humans rebel against God, we have a way back, which is worth celebrating, but angels don't. Their key role is as a messenger between God and humanity. So when Moses received the, the, the law on Mount Sinai, Jews believe it was angels that brought it to him. The nativity story just fits in with that. God had a message for Mary, so he sent an angel to, to send it. Angels protect human beings. You can read Elijah had a his eyes were opened and he saw a whole field full of armed angels that were going to protect him uh, from a powerful enemy. Angels were involved. When Peter was in prison, an angel turned up and let him out. When Jesus was in the garden the night before he was crucified, an angel appeared to him and strengthened him. When Paul was in a boat that was about to be shipwrecked, an angel appeared to him and said that no one would die. Angels are really active in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some people have had angels stay in their houses and not known about it. And Christians are going to be asked to judge the angels, it says in 1 Corinthians. That'll be interesting. So there's a lot in the Bible about angels. There's, there's other stuff I don't really understand. Are angels male or are they female? Actually, they're neither. 
It says God made humans male and female so that we could reproduce and fill the earth. He didn't have that mission for angels, so he didn't make them male or female, which is why some of these pictures are confusing. Do angels have wings? Well, those who are around the throne have wings, but if you had someone staying in your house who had a set of wings like that, I think you'd notice on the way to the bathroom, wouldn't you? So, I don't know. Um, There are a few things we shouldn't do with angels. We shouldn't worship angels. They're created beings. We should worship God alone. We shouldn't pray to angels. We should pray to Jesus. We shouldn't seek an encounter with angels. If we have one, that's God's doing and it's fantastic. But if we want intimacy with God, we should seek it through Jesus, not through angels. If you see an angel and have an angelic experience or a message from an angel, don't go on about it. Uh, Paul Uh, Paul in Colossians says so such a person goes into great detail about what they've seen they're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind so if you read a book about by someone who's met an angel mm, be suspicious take what the angel says but but don't go on about it don't get obsessed by angels if you go on uh, the internet, you can see classifications of angels, seven levels of angels, nine levels of angels, 14 levels of angels. It's all made up by people. The Bible tells us enough about angels for us to know what to do with them. Anyway, that's angels. We are now ready to look at the passage in Hebrews. Because this was written to Jewish believers. They had this understanding. Ain't God angels, humans. And then up pops Jesus. Where does he fit into the picture? And the the letter to the Hebrews says that angels are great, but Jesus is greater. It says he's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Here's a representation of someone you've probably seen on the telly. By the way, has anybody got one of these coins? Has anyone noticed in their pocket? One of them? No, me neither. They'll come out one day. But if this was your only understanding of what Charles looked like, I doubt whether you would recognize him if he walked past you. It's not a great representation, but the Son, Jesus, is the exact representation of what God is like. Jesus was involved in creation doing creation it was the angels were created and Stuart I think you read both of these or one of these God never said to any angel uh, what he said to Jesus you are my son today I have become your father see the relationship between Jesus and God is a father son relationship the angels relationship is a servant master relationship And God never said to any of the angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. God sits at God, sorry, Jesus sits at God's right hand, ruling and reigning. The angels don't do that. Angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation. Who's inheriting salvation? We are. The angels aren't, and the angels are sent to serve us. And I was thinking about this first. The angels, the previous two verses, it's a contrast. Angels do this, but Jesus. Angels are sent to serve, but Jesus, oh, he was sent to serve as well. Wow. But he wasn't sent. He volunteered. He served of his own free will. So the writer of the Hebrews is saying angels are great. Jesus is greater. And it was written to Jewish Christians who were finding life tough, who were under temptation to say, well, actually, maybe I'll stop following Jesus and I will revert back to the Jewish religion that I know really well that's based on angels being the communication between God and man. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, don't go back The past was great, but the future is greater. And sometimes as Christians, do we have a temptation temptation to go back? 
Oh, the songs were better in the old days. Don't like these new songs. Oh, I like the chapel up the hill, this huge building. Oh, I don't know about it. I love the sermons because I'm responsible for the website. I know that some people go on the sermons. On the website, they're looking for Jim Graham sermons and they, they can't find them these days. People want to go back, but we need to go forward. The Reformation was great in its time, but we need to go forward uh, and not back to, to, to fight the, 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 the battles we had in the past. That's what the letter of the, he, the, letter, the writer of the letter of the Hebrews is saying. But then let's go back to Mary. I've given you a background of angels and the understanding. And Mary, being a good Jewish girl, probably had a good understanding of what was going on. And an angel appeared to her and said, you're about the son, you're to call him Jesus. Now Jesus, I don't know if you know, is the same as the name Joshua. You know, Joshua who took over from Moses and has a book in the Bible named after him who led Israel into the promised land, who defeated the Canaanites were there, who is a great, great, great leader. And Mary said, your son is going to be a second Joshua. He's going to be called the son of the Most High. He's going to be a son of God, not, not a servant, just, not just a servant of God, the son of God. He's going to have the throne of his father, David. He's going to be a king. He's going to rule. And he's a descendant from David, a big clue that he was the Messiah. And his kingdom will never end Joshua ruled, died, and then it all went pear-shaped. David ruled, great king, he died, it all went pear-shaped. Jesus, his kingdom will never end. It doesn't have to go pear-shaped after this. So Mary recognized in this message all these hyperlinks back to the Old Testament, back to the promises of God. And her response was, yeah, I'm up for that. May it be to me as you have said. And then she wrote a poem about it, showing great understanding of what God was doing through her and through the son that she was going to bear. Final thought. At the end of the passage with Mary, it says, and then the angel left her. And as I was meditating on this, I thought, why did Luke put, and then the angel left her at the end of the passage? Because he tells lots of stories in his gospel, and lots of exciting things happen, but the stories don't generally end with, and then they all went home. So why is he putting that? He's not wasting his words. And I was looking at the passage, I thought, Luke, Luke doesn't waste his words. And yet here again, the Holy Spirit will come on you and, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And I thought, hmm, is this one event? Is this two events? Was, was Mary pregnant by the time the angel left? I don't know. Or was it a subsequent happening to her? I was meditating on this and trying to work out what, what is going on. So I had a look at the Greek translations of come on you and overshadow you and it's not because I'm really clever or have big books there are loads of tools on the internet that allow you to see the Greek translation and I saw these two words and then you can click on these and find out where else does Luke use the word epichomai or epischia oh I don't know whatever it says um and there are two other times he uses these. And I think Luke deliberately chose those words in order to highlight the parallel with these two other passages. And that's not me when I say I think. It's just the way people wrote in those days. It's the way the Bible works, that, that words are used deliberately to point to other passages. And we get the most out of a Bible passage when we actually look at different passages and compare and contrast them. And so the word come on you is used in Acts chapter 1, which Luke also wrote, 
uh, and um, Jackie was preaching from it a few weeks ago. Because what happened was, was the disciples were talking to the risen Jesus, and then he suddenly rose up into the air, and they're all looking up there, and an angel suddenly appears next to them saying, why are you looking at, up into the sky? This same Jesus will come back on you. Come back the way he disappeared. But wait, into Jeru- wait in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit will, epichomai, will come on you. And the other one I clicked on, overshadow you, that's his one other time by Luke, and that's where Jesus took some disciples up a mountain and Jesus was transfigured, he glowed, and there were Moses and Elijah talking to him and, and Peter got all really confused and said, oh, this is great, let's build a, a tent for you. Uh, and then they left. Now, I would encourage you, if you have time and the desire, look at this passage with Mary, the Annunciation and the Transfiguration and the Ascension, because Christians like jargony words, and we give words to these three events. And look at them. They've got surprise appearances, disappearances. What, what are the similarities? What are the same things? It's well worth your time because your understanding of all three will be enriched if you do that. But then Luke says the angel left Mary. So Luke is saying, what happened next? What happened next? With Mary, she had an amazing experience. And what happened next is she was obedient and said, yeah, I'm up for that. With the ascension... What happened next? The disciples did wait in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit came on them and the rest is history and we're all sat here this morning 2,000 years later. And then the middle one, the transfiguration, what happened next? Well, they came down the mountain and they couldn't throw out, they couldn't, um, there was a a boy with a demon and the disciples couldn't, couldn't evict the demon. And then they started arguing about which was the greatest disciple, and Jesus had to tell them off twice in quick succession. They didn't get it. They failed the test. And I was thinking, in our Christian life, we have some moments that are like the Annunciation, the Ascension, the Transfiguration, real spiritual high points where we feel close to God, where we've heard from God, we have a clear understanding that God is and he's interested in me. And they are fantastic, but they're rare. And most of the time, the Christian life, when you get up on a Monday after a great Sunday, is heavy slog, isn't it? You still have that annoying person at work who you have to love. You have all kinds of of difficulties where you have to be patient and kind and Christ-like. And you don't feel on a spiritual high, you just feel like it's hard work. But that's... How do we respond? We can't live on that mountaintop forever. We will come down. And, and it's the Monday morning. What do we do? Do we say, do we commit to saying, yes, Lord, I will treasure what you've done, but I know I can't live in it forever. But I will commit that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I will live for you. I will follow what you do. I will be obedient to you. And whatever you have planned for me, may it be to me according to your will. We have a choice before us. And as Steve just said, Mary's response was, may it be that your words to me will be fulfilled. In Hebrews 1 verse 6, it says that the angels worship the Son, Jesus. Let us be people who choose to worship Jesus. But let's be people also who, by the power of the Holy Spirit, announce great news. Can I invite you to stand as we um, respond to what God has been saying to us?
During an Advent season, we so often hear the story that we hear every Christmas. And as Steve said, going to another passage like Hebrews can sometimes help us understand the familiar in a new and fresh way. Jesus, I pray that um, you will help us by your Holy Spirit to rediscover afresh the joy of the great announcement from the angel Gabriel to Mary, but also the joy of your great announcement of good news to us individually and as a church. I thank you, Jesus, that you are King of kings, that you are Lord of lords. Help us to be people who announce that. I thank you that as you ascended, your spirit came and the church of Jesus was birthed. And we wait for your return, Jesus. And as we wait, we are empowered by your spirit, Choose to share you. Choose to celebrate you. Choose to advance your kingdom through our work and our worship. By your spirit, enable us to do that this week. And as we sing in response, continue to speak and minister to us. Amen.